I love uh, having and seeing new faces today, except knowing the middle of, a, of what we're studying. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a welcome uh, to have you here. Hope you can uh, hang on and try to join us midstream here because it hasn't been a very uh, um, on the surface not a very uplifting look we've been taking. Um, we have been looking at uh, Revelation 13 and history and prophecy and uh, present condition of our church and trying to reevaluate for us as Seventh-day Adventists what, uh, what this message is because you can't get to the three angels message and in uh, Revelation 14 without having to go through Revelation 13 to figure out what these people in the three angels message are preaching because these beasts come first. And um, so hang in there with us and uh, we'll, uh, um, we'll find our way, uh, won't we? Loud to see you. So um, Sephardic is a word of Spanish origin. And in fact, Sephard in Hebrew means Spain. So we get the word Sephardic uh, Judaism from, from that. In 135, the Romans expelled every Jew out of the area today known as Palestine, and they began to make their way around the world. And quite a hardy group of it settled in Iberia and peninsulas uh, between Portugal and Spain and thrived. And if you look at uh, European uh, Judaism, we, we are usually associated or uh, we know more about, at least, the Eastern European Judaism, the Ashkenaz. You know, that is more of the, uh, of the Russian and uh, Eastern, like I said, Eastern uh, Germanic and, and, uh, type of Judaism, uh, the type that uh, immigrated first. The Sephardic uh, Jews, like I said, are more in the Western side from Spain. And in the 14th century, the government of Spain and the Church of Spain conspired together in an honest effort, extending a hand, they said, in an honest effort to convert them. And in that, there were some that were converted, but they followed it up with what we know today as the Spanish Inquisition, because they didn't trust those conversions. And they even announced that once a Jew, always a Jew, it was in their blood. So those that didn't convert fell to the hands of the inquisitors. Jews were tried and burned for poisoning wells and bringing the plague and killing Christian children for their blood. Spain expels them all in 1492. Do you know where they found refuge? Pope Alexander VI offered every Jew refuge in an area around the Vatican. Alexander VI, by the way, is, his, his name was Rodrigo Borgia, so he, he, wasn't, he wasn't known as a very um, honest or sincere or authentic pope. He was corrupt, he was wildly ambitious, and, and uh, this is what the, um, the Encyclopedia of Christian History says about him. It may be his neglect of the sp spiritual inheritance of the church that contributed to the development of the Protestant Reformation. In other words, he was so politically in tuned and taking care of that side of it, what we've been studying about this beast from the sea, right? Taking care of the nationalistic or the... Uh, uh, the civil side of it, that he allowed the Reformation to begin to form. One of Alexander's uh, papal decrees, by the way, was given out in 1493 to reconfirm the rights of the Spanish crown in the New World because they had seen the reports that Christopher Columbus had been bringing back, 1492. So yes, the beginning, uh, the the monarchs, if you will, that expelled the Jews out of Spain were Ferdinand and Isabella. These invited Jewish refugees settled on the banks of the Tiber, not that far from the Vatican itself. And for 60 years, while the inquisitors threatened their very existence, they were kept safe 
by the popes that occupied the throne during that 60 year period. Then in 1555, Cardinal Gian Pietro Carafa, one of the leaders of the Roman Inquisition, who was a papal envoy to Spain before that, and was so enthralled and taken by the Spanish Inquisition, was part of the ones that started the Roman Inquisition, the Inquisitor, a, and a, an Inquisitor Cardinal, becomes Pope Paul IV. And he immediately urges a vigorous pursuit of quote unquote spiritual suspects. So what's the first group you think he found? His Jewish neighbors down the street. He said it's absurd and improper that these Jews have erupted into insolence. They presume to dwell side by side with Christians with no distinction in their dress to separate them. Therefore, we do issue the following ordinance. Jews are to own no real estate. They are to hire no Christian servants. Jews are no longer to ignore the ancient requirement of wearing distinctive clothing and badges. By the way, he makes them wear a, a yellow hood or shawl and a yellow cap, yellow. The taxes of Jews are to be increased. Jews are to live in a distinct quarter, cut off from the other sections of the city. They moved them to a section of the city, they walled it up, they put only one entrance in and one entrance out, and everyone was supposed to be in by sundown. So yes, the very first Jewish ghetto was instituted in 1555. Four square blocks, thousands of Jews crammed into this place. There was a church in the neighborhood with an inscription in Hebrew that said, come you unbelieving Jews. All of them were forced into the church every Sunday to hear Catholic sermons. What's neat in Jewish history, history was that it was documented that these transplanted Sephardic Jews put wax in their ears to keep them from hearing the words. So again, the power of the beast is a religious and a national one that works together. A force that Daniel didn't recognize and it terrified him, it horrified him. And sometimes the national part works separate from the church part. But when they come together, they exercise this full power that the prophecy warns us about. So it brings us to our beast. Again, we pick on both beasts here, right? We're equal opportunity beast exposers. So we come to our beast, that two-headed one, the one that comes out of the land, the one that gives that old power, the one that we saw that gives that old power a, a new identification and a new coat of paint. And yes, it's painted red, white, and blue. And we think about this second beast because we're told that this, what, this one performs great signs so that he may even make fire come down out of heaven to earth in the presence of men. The dragon goes out to make war, remember, in chapter 12, verse 17. But the essence of the war is to make these signs. That's the war that this beast unleashed. And the, and the purpose of making these signs is to worship the first beast. In other words, to create an image to worship the first beast. Again, the homage is to the power. It isn't necessarily to the ones who, who instigated or perpetrated it. The homage is to the power anytime. Any time that a national power comes together with the church of the day of the Ecclesi and, and gives it ecclesiastical power, that is Babylon. So the greatest of these signs, according to John, according to the prophecy, is that he's able to make fire come down to earth out of heaven. When you think of fire from heaven, you think of two biblical events, don't we? Pentecost and what? Mount Carmel. Elijah and Baal and Pentecost, the fire of Pentecost when it comes down out of heaven. In both cases, there's a challenge of authority in both that was answered by a mighty sign of God. In other words, true worship of God was challenged by two groups and, and God answered both with a sign of his own. And both of the signs were what? Fire that did 
and actually came from where? From heaven, from him himself. The gospel that the apostles speak of was represented and it was challenged. And in that upper room, God came down and, and fire and tongues and they spoke of the one true God. The challenge was, how do we reach these, these, these many uh, believers who are here today, these many Jewish uh, pilgrims, if you will, that are here for Pentecost because none of them speak the same language. They all come from the diaspora. So the challenge was presented to the gospel and God answers with what? With fire comes down from heaven and all of a sudden everybody knows the same language. On, on Mount Carmel though, the authority of the true God and his prophet Elijah representing him was challenged by the worshipers and the priests of Baal. The true God sent fire to speak of his true power. In both cases, God used what to demonstrate his power? Fire. This time, this beast though, this one, in public and in view of everybody, performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of who? In the presence of men. This time, this counterfeit sign, it comes down on the wrong altar. Because this one is paying homage to a beast that has no problem bringing these two powers together. Redefining for whoever witnesses, redefining for the men that this, that this fire comes down in presence of, redefining what power really is, redefining what worship really is. This time the event will be repeated as the whole world watches. And it comes down on the wrong altar. This time it comes down on Baal's altar. By the way, the worship of Baal, a state-sponsored religion. Because it was headed by the king of Israel's wife, Jezebel. The wife of Ahab was originally from Phoenicia and daughter of Ethbal, king of Sidon, priest of Baal and Astarte. His name is Ethbal, of Baal. We know that he's at least a priest of the god Baal and the goddess Astarte, both fertility gods of the main religion of Tyre and Sidon. She single-handedly led the king and all the people into worship of Baal. Remember, the only ones left are Isaiah and who? I mean, uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Isaiah. Uh, how many more do I have to go before I get to Elijah. Elijah and how many others when he thought that he was alone, right? 70 others, right? That's it. She personally supported the 450 prophets of Baal with taxes, Israeli taxes that Ahab collected himself. It's a near perfect Israeli version of the mixture of church and state and the trouble that we can get into when it happens. And you'll remember as we went through the seven churches, the two churches that had warnings about Jezebel were the ones that began this from Constantine all the way up until about, remember, 1250 is what we were looking at. The problem with them was Jezebel. The problem with them was, again, this new power, this nearly irresistible seduction that the church has to reach out to get power that doesn't belong to her to make it hers. So the dragon as it's set that he has these two beasts deceive the whole world to, to thinking that they are worshiping the true God. Trinity and all, by the way. The dragon and two beasts. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The worship will be completely corrupted or perverted, if you will. And this one, this, this two-horned one that we've been looking at for the past couple of weeks, he's lamb-like. He looks more like Jesus than the beast that came before him. And the Christianity of this beast, the church part of this beast, has fully embraced her national identity also. The church just can't seem to help from reaching out to lay hold of this power. 
I pointed it out before that in the vision, even John is wondering about it, isn't he? I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the witnesses uh, to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly what? I was greatly amazed. And the angel had to say to him what? Why are you so amazed? Remember John's writing at a time where he's the only one left. He saw everyone and hundreds and thousands, hundreds of others of Christians who were martyred at the hands of the state. And he had to wonder for just a minute, for just one minute, when he saw this power, when he saw the woman that was the church actually now decked out as this prostitute of Babylon who is actually riding the beast. She's in control of it. John had to wonder for just one second. Maybe if we latch onto this power a little bit, a few of my friends would still be alive. So this religious power, this mix of Jesus and America. I already went after America's perverted ideas of freedom and I have no problem calling him that. Remember, we looked at the Constitution. We looked at, at, at what the document actually says and, and, and how, it in, how it encoded slavery into it from the very beginning. In other words, the Constitution only provided for freedom for white men who had land. So it, it gets embedded into the North American church's soul. The prophecy says, lamb-like, but still a what? Still a beast. The deception, though. The deception for the church. I was never taught any of the history that I cited to you last week. How many here was taught in school any of the history that I cited last week? Not one of us. By the way, I have, I have a, a seminary education. I was never taught this history in my church education either. I would expect the deception on the national side, wouldn't you? I think the church sometimes spends way too much time shouting at the dark. We curse the world for being dark when actually that's what it is. <laughs> and we spend so much time and anger that they are what they are. I expect that from the national side. Don't you? He's trying. We're trying. We really are. And by the way, I have no problem, absolutely no problem with us having to be citizens of any of these nations. We have to, don't we? I mean, by our very mission, we have to. We need to be present. We need to be showing these people what true power looks like. We need to be calling out this deception whenever we see it. We are here to love people as we have been loved. And in order to do that, we have to be in these nations, don't we? We need to be good citizens. The church part, though, that's the part that gets me. What's the one that we are truly in charge of? What's the one that we can really control? Our part, the church part. So can the church part have anything to do with this power? What is the answer to that? Can the church part have anything to do with this kind of power? The answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. He called out with a mighty voice of Revelation 18. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It's become a dwelling place of demons, a haunt of every foul spirit, a haunt of every foul and hateful bird, a haunt of every foul and hateful beast. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And remember her fornication, remember what her fornication, who it is. It's the church. It's the church that made the nations drink, not the other way around. All the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxury. I told you the very first papal uh, bull or papal decree of Alexander VI was to make sure that Spain could still travel across international waters and have her spot in the new world. Why? What is the only reason why? What did opening up to the new world mean to merchants in the old world? I 
Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Remember, that's a message of hope. That's the message of hope that we all have. As long as we're here and as long as we're breathing, we can do what? We can come out. Come out of her, my people, so that you do not take part in her sins, so that you do not share in her plagues. Remember, this is the perverted church. This is the church that has completely embraced this kind of power. This is the church that allows her politics to dictate her theology, her politics to dictate her eschatology, her politics to dictate how she treats other people. We can't have anything to do with that church. So the problem is this nationalized church, it's been deified, right? This, this national identity of the church is completely deified in whatever nation it happens to be, ours included and even more. The whole world wonders. Why? Because it looks awfully, awfully attractive. I said, I think that the, the reason that the beast looks so good and that the whole world wonders after the beast is personally, it's exactly the kind of God we would create if we could create God. Imagine being able to be Jesus whenever you want and then being able to be the dragon whenever you want. Because we all have that one neighbor we know we can't love, right? Right? This God gives you permission to act on it. This God gives you permission to do something else about it rather than love. Even though Jesus keeps saying, I, you've heard it say, love your neighbor, hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. What? Really? And the beast church will let you do whatever you want. The beast church will let you say, well, I think that Jesus was really speaking metaphorically. So this idea, so we have to begin to dismantle the deification of this power. How many here want to do that? How many here are up for that? I'd like to. I'd like to dismantle it right now, wouldn't you? Oh, by the way, it's going to be with us all the way up until the second coming. Sorry. But what do we do about it while we're here? We can dismantle it. We have to do it by exercising the power, the real power of the gospel that has been given to us. Not this false power, not this part-time love, not this, this metaphorical love, but actually having to do it. We need to examine then what's at the core of this. See, Laodicea is happy being locked inside by themselves. Jesus is outside the door of this church. A church that claims to be a church of Jesus Christ has actually locked him out. Why? Because I'm rich and have need of what? I have need of nothing. So we need to go after whatever it is happening on the inside, right in here, that leads us to believe that we have need of nothing. So I want to... Talk about a principle this week that we need to get at. A principle that I believe Laodicea has to get at and to begin to dismantle in our doors. Forget the nation. Let's talk about us. How did we get here? How did we get so comfortable? How did we get so lukewarm? What are we locked in the door with? that makes us believe we don't have anything. And I need to say this very, very carefully. But one of the things that we're locked in with is that we're locked in with our Bibles, aren't we? The authority that the church gets from the inside, even though they've locked Jesus out, they believe they don't need Jesus because we have what? We have his word. And it's true, we do. It's true, we do. But what has that, or where has that gotten Laodicea? To believing, to actually believing that we could lock Jesus out because we're good Bible students? In fact, not only do we have uh, that, we also have a supposed lesser light shining to on the, the uh, greater light. We have even more revelation and we call it present truth. So I need to get at a principle here, and it's a principle that I've been to before, 
but, but I continue to come back to it because I really think that we need to begin to discern between the two. God's word. What really is God's word? So I'd like you to meet with me at the foot of Sinai. Moses brings Israel to this mountain to offer them what he offered Moses 40 years before. Just the Lord used to speak to Moses what? Face to face as one speaks to a friend. The entire exodus is a journey to go get all God's kids, bring them to the mountain, Moses, because I wanna do for them what I've done for you. Which means they all have an opportunity to meet God what? Face to face. He asks a friend of his to bring all of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's children to him. The ones that he promised Abraham he would have. The ones that he promised Abraham would be his. Bring him to the mountain so they can have your opportunity. He puts them through three days of elaborate preparation. And on the third day, he says this, prepare for the third day, because on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. I once wrote a paper once that talked about all the good things that happen on the third day. Tons of good stuff happened on the third day in all the Hebrew scriptures. Salvation usually happens on the third day. Speaking of Elijah, in the third year, on the third day, three and a half years, the rain started after that confrontation between God and Baal. Three and a half years in the wilderness, three and a half years, three days, always salvation comes on the third day. Prepare for the third day, because on the third day, the Lord will what? He'll come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of who? in the sight of all the people. He's gonna show up. After 400 years in slavery, has an Egyptian God ever offered to come down and be with the Egyptian worshipers? That's not the gods we know in Egypt, right? That's not Ra, that's not Nut, that's not uh, any of them, right? That's not the Nile, that's not the sun. None of them ever offered. This one says, I'll come down on what day? on the third day. Then some more instructions, and it is, it is, it, it looks rather daunting at first. Don't, no hand shall touch them, but they shall be stoned. You can't, you can't touch inside that area. Before the third day, keep everybody back, keep everybody out. This is going to be a special place. This is gonna be the place where I meet you. By the way, in prophetic history now, in, Oze, in Hosea and everywhere else, the, the, honey, the honeymoon of God and his people is always described as right here. That was our honeymoon in the wilderness because it was just you and me. I got you out of all of your slavery. I freed you from all of that. I freed you from the oppression of Egypt and all of its gods and brought you out. And in the wilderness, it was just you and me. Every time God puts the, the words of the wilderness into a prophet's mouth in the future, now it sounds just like a lovesick groom pining for the honeymoon with his bride. This is it. So yeah, don't mess the place up before it's time. But something was supposed to happen. When the trumpet sounds, a what? A long blast. Tell them that they can what? Come up the mountain. God's gonna come down. He's gonna do his part. And Israel was given the invitation to what? Come up the mountain. Come up the mountain. And did they offer, did they accept the offer of this friendship with the living God of the universe? Did they? When all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking, they were what? They were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance. What'd they miss? In the midst of all that, I'm not saying that they were liars and I'm not saying that they didn't have reason to tremble. The mountain was actually quaking. The mountain was full of smoke and, and very loud in noise. The, the thunder and the lightning is right there. It's right there. And so yes, I'm not saying that they don't have reason to, but also he promised that there would be something within the midst of the noise. And what was it? The trumpet. 
It's going off too. It's not like he shut the trumpet down in order for them to listen to the thunder and the lightning. It's right there in its midst. It can be what? It can be heard. I think it would be okay even to go up the mountain trembling. I'm, I'm good with that. He would be good with that. But they absolutely refuse, don't they? 400 years of slavery. 400 years of being convinced that when you hear thunder and lightning, it means that gods are angry. And not just are they angry, they're angry with you. This kind of fear keeps the slaves in their place. Slaves cower because they're oppressed and they're subservient to this fear. They're missing the point. What they don't understand or what they don't see is that this God is different. He offered to come down. He offered to speak to them through the noise. He offered to reach them in their fear and their trembling. And they just couldn't believe it. They just couldn't buy it. By the way, after 400 years of torture, persecution, and slavery, I'm probably not going to be able to buy it either. None of us would be. I think that's the point of this. There was only one man prepared to accept this invitation because he had already accepted it 40 years ago. When he saw the fire on the mountain, what did he do? He went up it to figure out what it was. And when he got there, who did he find? Remove your sandals, Moses, because it's just you and me now. So I think this is the place where the children of Abraham broke their real father's heart. Not that he didn't know, he knew it was coming. But he went through with his offer, didn't he? He goes through with it. You speak to us, they tell Moses, and we will listen, but don't let God speak to us or we will what? That's how afraid they are of him. You think that really, he would call them up the mountain just to kill them if they were trembling? They think so. They think so. The people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. The Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, you've seen for yourselves that I spoke to you from heaven. I spoke to you. I just want you to know before what happens next, before what happens next, I want you to know that I came to you first. I came to speak to you first. Not an intercessor, a face-to-face intercession because for the next four chapters, God speaks to Moses in the thick darkness. Israel listens. They can hear God's words, but they're really more like eavesdropping. The only one that's getting the full presence of God is Moses himself. He's inside the cloud. And by the way, Israel is out there, not because God said, well, you know, if, if you're going to remain uh, sinners and, and kind of idol worshipers of Egypt, I'm going to have to lock you out. No, they're out by choice, aren't they? And God gives them what they ask for. They want a limited presence. They want the same relationship with this God that the Egyptians had with their gods. Because every God in Egypt has their own priest and priesthood, right? They speak to their gods through intercessors. And the message is always the same. The intercessors always come back. Well, God's pretty ticked at you again. Look at it, listen. Thunder, lightning. You make the sun angry in Egypt and it'll bake the skin right off of you. You anger the Nile and it'll flood. They hear God's words, but that's all. They're eavesdropping. That face-to-face friendship is what they're refusing. The one thing that could dissolve their fear, an opportunity to get to know him for who he really is and what he's offering to them. So later, God calls Moses up the mountain and he keeps him there 40 days. 
40 days this time, not four chapters, but 11 chapters of how this priesthood and this sacrificial system is gonna work. That's what you see all through the rest of the, of the book of Exodus. It's pretty much all about this. After all that, Moses then is carrying down what we think is something good. When God finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him what? He gave him two tablets of the covenant, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. That sounds pretty good. This is the part of the movie where, where everybody thinks that it's good. Charlton Heston thought that it was good, right? Everybody thinks that this was what it was all about, that this is what it was for. But what we forget is that this is the results of them refusing the invitation to walk and to talk with God. They've backed him into a corner that now he has to what? Now he has to write it down. And of course, Israel is just eagerly awaiting this revelation from this intercessor, aren't they? They're just eagerly awaiting. They're, they're all there trembling on their knees, waiting for Moses to come back down with this, aren't they? When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, come make gods for us who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. What are they doing with their fear? They're trying to find a reason not to fear anymore. They're going back to what they know. At least this we can control. By the way, the only difference between idolatry and worshiping the living God is the worshiper himself. In idolatry, the worshiper's in charge. The worshiper can make the God, the worshiper then can make the God do whatever the worshiper wants. And by the way, if the God doesn't act the way the worshiper wants, what can the worshiper do? Just make another one. The only difference between idolatry and worshiping the living God is who's in charge of worship. They're taking control. We worship idols because they're safe. Or we at least believe that they're safe. It's because we can control them. Israel's doing exactly what we would do. By the way, not only did Aaron say yes to making this mold and melting the gold that God gave them, by the way, from the plunder of the Egyptians, and put, making it into a golden calf, he's the one that tells them, here are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. By the way, Aaron, the first one to be high priest in this new system, he made the golden calf, and he calls them their gods. Moses comes down and says, dude, what's up, man? And Aaron goes, you know how these people can be? You know how stiff-necked and obstinate they can be? I said to them, whoever has gold, take it off. So they gave it to me. I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. It's the funniest and saddest line in the Bible I've ever, I pretty much have ever heard, right? He's terrified. He's horrified. He doesn't even know what he's saying. So anyway, after this, Moses loses it a little bit, doesn't he? He doesn't remain calm. He loses it. He breaks the tablets. He grounds the calf up, puts the ashes and burns it, puts the ashes in water, makes Israel drink it. And then, and then in, in, this, in this fit again, he continues and he tells the men of Levi to start killing people. First he asks, he asks, who's on the Lord's side? Remember, he stands there and says, who's on the Lord's side with me? <laughs> All the sons of Levi, their hands shoot up immediately. What would you do? Heck yeah, I'm on the Lord's side now, right? And they did as Moses commanded and about 3,000 of the people fell on that day. 3,000 people within that encampment around Sinai. This, this whole thing that began as God's honeymoon 40 days ago with his kids and it ends with the blood of 3,000 people lapping around their feet and their ankles. Today you've ordained yourselves for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of a son or a brother, which means that they killed the men. 
They killed the men for instigating this. And he said that there wasn't anybody there who was not touched by this. They lost a son or a what? Or a brother. And I, you can read this next line the way you want, but the way that I read it, and he says, so you brought a blessing on yourselves today. Moses might as well ask, do you guys feel blessed now? See, because that's what earthly gods ask for. You transgress an earthly God and somebody has to pay, right? So surely this is enough payment right here. And, and, and Moses calls him out on it. 3,000 dead, guys. You feel blessed? Do you feel atoned? What's the answer to that? No, absolutely not. That's Moses' tone right there. And it gets him to think of something crazy. It gets him to think of something absolutely crazy. The next day, Moses said to the people, you've sinned a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can what? Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. What's he gonna do? The only one that has a face-to-face -face relationship with God has decided that he's gonna go back face-to-face -face and ask God for something. And what is it? for forgiveness. The only one that has a face-to-face -face relationship, the only one that doesn't fear him, the only one has this idea. We say that Moses is an extraordinary man, and he is, but what made him extraordinary? What made him extraordinary was this face-to-face -face relationship he has with this God. He can tell them here right now, perhaps I will go up and I can ask. You know why? Because I know him. And it doesn't sound as crazy it isn't as crazy as it sounds. It sounds crazy, I know. We just ask him? I've been with him for 40 years, though. And this is kind of the way he is. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people have sinned a great sin. They've made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you would only what? If you would only forgive their sin. So what did he do? He did just what he promised. First, he what? He asks. And then he says, but if you won't, then do what? Blot me out from the book that you have written. He first asks, can you just forgive him? And then it's almost like he catches himself. Nah, that's crazy. That's crazy. So, so why don't you just kill me too? Die for the people. They deserve death. So why don't I die in their place? You know, Paul has that, uh, that analogy too in, in the book of Romans, in, in Romans chapter five, when he's trying to explain what Jesus really did. You know, that, that somebody who would die. And he, and he said, you know, uh, nobody's gonna die for somebody else. He says, nobody will do it. He said, maybe, just maybe a real, 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 real good man might die for another, but otherwise, no, right? It's remarkable that Moses would ask this. But it isn't what we think that it could be because God gives an answer. He says, the Lord said, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But then he immediately says, but go in peace. Go in peace and lead the people to the place which I've spoken to you. See, my angel will go in front of you. Nevertheless, when the day comes for punishment, I will punish them for their sin. The Lord sent the plague to the people they made, that made the calf, the one that Aaron made. So God, by his answer, says, no, Moses, I don't work that way. I'm not an angry God that can be appeased because one good man wants to die or offers to die. You don't need to appease me with your goodness, Moses. People have been sacrificing innocent children to angry gods for thousands of years now. I don't play those games. That isn't me. Moses, you can't buy my forgiveness for their sin. It can't be bought. And why does he say? Because it isn't time yet, right? It isn't time for that one man who will come to die for everybody's sin. He said, Moses, it's not your place, but don't worry, I've got a plan.
And by the way, the beautiful reward that Moses gets is that he gets to see Jesus one week. He gets to go down and, and with Elijah see Jesus for a, a week before Jesus dies on the cross for everybody's sin. He asked if he could see the glory, and, the glory and the salvation of Israel. He wasn't allowed to see it from Mount Nebo. He got to see it on the Mount of Transfiguration. What about the plague, Greg? I don't know. I haven't worked out the plague yet. But there is something curious about this plague. There's no report about the casualties for this one. Why? I'm not 100% sure. And, and, and this, this thought is only half formed, okay? It's only half formed. But there is something about it is that number one, uh, we don't know what the body count was and he's never left it out before. But maybe a way to look at this is that even when he is justly provoked and dared to act like an angry, vengeful Egyptian God would, he refuses to do it and he still gets down to his business. I'm not sure. See, because we forget what happened before Moses came down the first time, before he comes down from the golden calf. Moses, God knows that, Mo, that there's something up and he tells Moses that there's, that there's something up. So the Lord says to Moses, he says, I've seen these people. He's preparing Moses for what, they, what he's going to see when he gets down the mountain. He's preparing him for the golden calf. I've seen these people and behold, they are obstinate people. Now then let me alone that my anger may burn against them, that I might destroy them and make you a great nation. Moses entreat the Lord his God and said, oh Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak saying with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Lord, turn from your burning anger. Change your mind about what you're about to do to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens and all this land of which I've spoken, I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it. So the Lord did what? Moses reports that the Lord changed his mind about the harm that he would do the people. See, the people have chosen to try to relate to this living God by eavesdropping, by only hearing his word and not coming in face to face. By the way, from here on out, they are now going to try to live that life with word written on the paper rather than trying to eavesdrop on Moses' relationship with them. It's now going to be written in stone and then it's going to be written on paper. When Moses came down, he knew that God wasn't going to wipe them out because he pleaded, he interceded. And he's carrying the only hope that they've asked for. And he realizes it. I think that halfway down, what he realizes is that this is no hope at all. Because all the commandments say is thou shalt what? Not. And by the time he gets to the foot of the mountain, they violated the first three and big time. And Moses looks at him and says, what's this going to do for him now? Just remind them of what they've done? I don't think he smashed him because he was angry. I think he smashed him because at that particular time they were worthless. All the words on the tablet were going to do was condemn them in a sin that they were already condemned for. And the only one that could do something about it is still up the mountain and they're still down here refusing to go to him. And Moses knows it. And he's the only one that can come up with the idea that this God up on that mountain has the grace to want to save people who don't necessarily worship him. He pleads with God. He risks death at that moment for all he knows. He comes down to show them all they have chosen, the tablets and the commandments. All that they've done is chosen a relationship with him that they cannot save them. A relationship with God on the tablet can only condemn us. 
Because all the tablet says is what not to do of what we've already not done. So what does he do? He goes back up the mountain. Comes back down, by the way, with brand new ones. <laughs> brand new ones. And what did they do with it? It's funny, I'm not even sure that they read it first. What did they do with it? They immediately stuck it in an ice chest that only one man was allowed to even be near the ice chest for one day a year. And again, if you think this is something Moses, I mean, if you think that this is something God wanted, this relationship, always remember that the Lord used to speak to Moses, what? Face to face, as one who speaks to a friend. By the way, Aaron will only be allowed in the sanctuary one day per year on the Day of Atonement. The high priest is the only one that gets to go all the way into God's presence. But while Moses was alive and while they were around the wilderness, Moses got to go into his presence whenever the cloud descended on the sanctuary. He was under no restrictions whatsoever because he's the only one that said, you know what, guys? This is a real cool relationship. I wish you would come with me. So... If we're really serious about wanting to get at this deification that Laodicea seems to be happy and fine with is that we need to get at this relationship that we have with the written word and to begin to make it live. In prayer meeting for about five years now, we all of a sudden saw the word. We, it's, it's, been, it's happened for us before. The word's been lifted off the page. The word became flesh and walked among us. Things begin to happen when we, when we adopt this. Things begin to happen when, when the word opens up to us and we begin to have this relationship with the Messiah that, that only Moses had and only those who want this relationship are the ones who have it. Moses was the only one that had it. Notice his argument. Why should the Egyptians say, I know you're better than this? By the way, Moses was one of those priests, wasn't he? He was trained as one of those priests of those Egyptian gods. His argument back to him was, you're better than those guys. I know you are. Why should the Egyptians say that which I know is wrong about you? Moses only, he's, 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 not, he's not grasping at straws. You know, he's not trying tricks on him. He really knows this about him because he's the only one that will walk with him face to face. Is he extraordinary? Yes, he is. Because at this time, he's the only friend of God. Everyone else is satisfied with backing off and backing off and backing off. Till we get to the day when you're reading in the Gospel of John, that, that the religious leaders, that the church of the day are even willing to separate themselves from Jesus and holding their Bibles in front of him as proof that he can't be who he claims to be. They use his scriptures to tell him that he's not of God. They use the dead word on the page or on the tablet to tell the living word that he's not of God. You search the scriptures because in them you think you find eternal life but it is they that testify of me and you refuse to come to me to find life. If we're going to get at why Laodicea thinks that they have need of nothing, one of the reasons why is because they seem to only be able to worship God on the page and on the tablet. And we refuse to open the door because it's a whole lot easier to justify and to rationalize and to make the, the scripture say. I, I pointed out last week that the church has been making the scripture say whatever she's been wanting them to say. They can do that when it's only on the page. You can't do that when the living word walks in the room and proves every bit of what you're interpreting of what we're interpreting and blows it away with one statement like love your enemies. Wait a minute, I, there's a bunch of pages in here that says I can hate my enemies. There's a bunch of pages in here where God wiped out my enemies for me. But the living word comes in and says, yeah, you've heard it said, but I say to you, 
And not only did he say it, he lived it. Jesus is outside the door because we don't want him in. He's gonna mess up everything that we've figured out. He's gonna mess up the people that we've decided not to love and have been told don't belong. He's gonna mess all that up. Because when he came, he came to prove one thing. On that day you'll ask in my name, I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. We talk about Jesus being our intercessor, being our high priest, and he is, he really is, but he doesn't intercede the way that we think that he has to intercede. See, a priest of one of those angry gods has to go in to appease the anger of the God to, for him to not take it out on the worshipers. Jesus said, I don't know, I'm not gonna go in and do that. You guys don't have to ask me to do that. I won't ask the Father on your behalf. Why? For the Father himself loves you. Because you've loved me and have believed that I came from God, the Father also loves you. He said, when you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. That's a relationship that Israel never had with the Father. Like I said, Israel now for thousands of years since Sinai, they've been rolling the dice with this God up on the mountain. They don't know if they're going to get manna in the morning or a plague and a curse at night. Jesus blows him away. He said, I know how you feel about the Father. But what I'm here to tell you is that this relationship can change hearts and minds. To walk and talk is what changes hearts and minds. And forgive me for saying so, but not a deeper Bible study. Because the word on the page can't. The word on the page can only introduce us to the living word. Eventually, we're gonna have to let him in. Or we can continue to be content with the half condemnation, half love, whatever that the tablet tells our fallen and selfish natures what's good and what isn't, especially about other people. And we've already seen who the beasts find Right? Who the beast finds attractive. The rich, the powerful, the ones that have money. The church, the church of the beast is based on that. It's based on power of, of money and numbers and, 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 and popularity. The church of the lamb that was slain is based on love and that's what makes it unpopular. And remember, the church, the, the people that worship at the church of the lamb that was slain always look like they're losing in this game. The beast always looks like he's winning. Because love on a planet that has fallen and is living out its selfishness, one act of selflessness, it looks stupid. Why are you wasting your time? Why are you wasting your time dying for somebody else? This is what changes hearts and minds. Open our minds possibility that God simply loves us. Period. Now whatever we read after that has to be looked at through those lenses. And the only way that my heart and my mind will ever be changed about that is to continue to walk and talk with him. Am I going to be all that I should be the moment I begin to walk with talk with him? No, that's not how relationships work, right? That's not how love works. We grow. And tomorrow, we should be more loving than we were the day before. And there'll be days when we're worse than we were the day before. But God says, whatever you're fearing, whatever you're trembling, always remember this, okay? Jesus isn't, isn't the good guy that you send into the bad God to try to get him to do what you want. Jesus said, if you believe in me and you believe that I loved you, then you're gonna have to accept the fact that the Father loves you too. There was a, a movie that came out in 2015 based on a, on a book, on a biography written about Srinivasa Ramanujan, a Hindu mathematician that came to study at Cambridge in the 1930s. 
and uh, he had no formal uh, education at all. He was a postal clerk in India, and, and, and um, he, he, be, he did his own mathematics, and he sent them to Dr. G.W. Hardy at Cambridge, and he was absolutely enthralled, so Hardy invites him. And the whole movie is about that trip to Cambridge in the years that he spent on campus teaching people his, his areas of math. And, and he made substantial contributions to mathematical analysis and number theory and infinite series and continued fractions, including solutions to mathematical problems then considered unsolvable, seeking mathematicians who could better understand his work in 1913 is when he begins correspondence. I'm sorry, I said 30, I meant 13 in the teens. And the thing about Cambridge at the time is that, that, that uh, Bertrand Russell was there and everything else, and, and the idea or the thought of the English Enlightenment and, and, and the humanism of the time. Bertrand Russell goes on to become one of the most eloquent atheists that ever lived, and he knew him. You know? And Hardy, Hardy was also, Hardy tells uh, uh, Ram, Dr. Ram Munijan, well, he, he didn't get his, he's an honorary doctorate, he didn't need it, but he tells him always that he didn't believe in God. And there's this line in this movie that was in the book that Ram Munijan told Dr. Hardy when he said that he didn't believe in God. Even though Ram Munijan believed that math was proof that there was a God. That this Hindu said, the reason that I know that there is the divine is because there's math. And he said, an equation means nothing to me unless it expresses a thought of God. From this devout Hindu. And this professor, this, this, this uh, laureled professor at one of the oldest divinity schools in the world, Cambridge, tells him that he doesn't believe in God. And this line from Ramunajan, I love, he says, you believe in God, you just don't believe he likes you very much. On that day, you will ask in my name. And I don't say that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. Because you've loved me and have believed that I came from God. So the first thing we have to get at is this healthy or not so healthy relationship we have with the written word and somehow get it to open the door for us to the living word. It isn't enough to read and to study or even to read and study and pray. There comes a point in time when we need to walk and talk with the living word. So I'm gonna spend the next couple weeks, except next week. Next week we're having communion and we'll take a break from the beast and we will, we will shy away from the beast. We don't wanna invite him to our communion table, right? It's just us, just us and him. But the next, next two weeks, I wanna get at this. I wanna, I wanna get in behind the door at Laodicea and see if we can sever at least a couple of unhealthy relationships to get us up to the door and unlock it and let him in to where you and I weren't even members of Laodicea anymore. To where we actually begin to live that in our circle, no one shall miss the grace of God. Thank you for holding on with me. Thank you for uh, giving me uh, your time. Thank you.